all these great superfoods that would be impossible to gather myself. Kachave is my secret.
Good evening. Can you please take your seats? Good evening. Hi. Oh, thank you so much for whoever answered good evening. Ah, thank you. <laughs> My name is Paula Goldstein, and I am the president and CEO of Jewish Family and Children's Service of Greater Philadelphia. I welcome you and thank you for being part of this extremely important discussion around gun violence and its impact on our community. In light of the most recent mass shootings in California and the countless others that occurred over the course of last year, this has been on the minds of so many and is an issue that simply cannot be ignored. In 2022 alone, over 500 Philadelphians died from gun violence, and over 1,700 were victims of non-fatal shootings in one year. This brings to mind one of JFCS's core values, one that is rooted in a Jewish concept called tikkun olam. Translated, this literally means repairing the world. As an agency dedicated to aiding, assisting, and responding to the needs of children, families, and individuals. It's our responsibility to do our part to make our community safer and our world better. My hope is that what you hear tonight can bring us one step closer to achieving this mission. Because this topic is a powerful one that may be emotionally triggering for some, we have arranged to have a JFCS social worker on site tonight, our Director of Counseling Services, Christina Kaminos, who's wa waving her hand in the back. Christina can, oh, I did ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> Christina will be available at the end of this program to provide support as needed. And finally, on behalf of JFCS, I want to thank Congregation Rhoda Shalom and Rabbi Ellie Friedman for not only hosting, but car co-sponsoring this event with us. And of course, we would not be here without all of our incredible panelists, the politicians, public servants, and activists who have made it their mission to make our streets safer. And now I will turn things over to Rabbi Friedman. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I'm uh, Rabbi Eli Friedman. It's uh, an honor to be here tonight to welcome you all to uh, Congregation Road of Shalom. And I'll say I, I really want to just thank a couple people, um, especially who I'll be welcoming up in a second, our, our lay leader, Doug Rosenblum, who really has been such a champion um, for this work. And Doug has not only been the head of our um, own synagogue task force on reducing gun violence, but actually really um, brought together congregations, um, Jewish congregations from across the whole region to form uh, a newly formed Southern, uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania coalition of synagogues for reducing gun violence. And so I'm just really excited to see so many from those congregations here tonight. Uh, this week in our Torah, uh, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, we read a, a different section of the Torah each week. We sort of work our way through. And this week in the Torah, we are in the book of Exodus. We are actually reading about the ten plagues. This week, we read about the final three plagues, the plagues of locusts, darkness, and then the killing of the firstborn. Um, it's hard not to immediately think about the modern plagues in our society and the plague of gun violence that truly has become a, a pestilence across this nation. Um, we're told throughout the Torah that each time the plague comes, Pharaoh hardens his heart, right? He's about to let the Israelites go. If you know the Passover story, after each plague, he says, oh, this is horrible. How can we go? We have to let them go. But then his heart is hardened. Strange phrase, right? It, it becomes hard like rock. And then he changes his mind and says, nope, not going to let them go. It finally takes the death of his own son to get Pharaoh's heart to soften enough to let them go. 
the analogy is kind of obvious, and I, I, I wonder often, what is it going to take to soften the hearts of those in our society? Um, too many have had their hearts hardened by this plague of gun violence that continues. And I think it's through programs like tonight, it's telling the stories, it's meeting people, it's having conversations that we begin to slowly soften those hearts to enable us to really take action. And so it's my honor to, to welcome you all tonight and I turn things over to um, really my, my, my partner, my leader in this work, Doug. Thank you and good evening, everyone. I want to start by thanking JFCS and Rhoda Shalom for hosting tonight's program. I'd also like to thank specifically Rabbi Friedman for his engagement with me on this issue for many years. I'd like to also thank Lisa Ney and Sharon Schwartz, who are in the audience tonight, who have uh, really worked very hard to pull this together, and I thank them. I have been a congregation for more than 15 years. Currently, I'm an attorney in private practice, and I focus on fraud investigations. But my, um, my experience earlier in my career really informs the work that I do here. I previously served as a prosecutor, and I have prosecuted gun, crime, gun crimes excuse me, in both federal and state court. Those cases involved prosecuting people who unlawfully possessed firearms, and I've also prosecuted numerous murder cases, most of which included the use of a firearm. I have indelible memories of those cases and the unnecessary loss and trauma that gun violence has caused. In my days as a prosecutor, one of the largest firearms confiscated in a particular year, and I will never forget this, was a loaded Desert Eagle semi-automatic pistol found in the waistband of a 13-year-old child in Norristown. I care deeply about my family and about my community, and I have lived and worked in the greater Philadelphia region my entire life. The United States is a fantastic country with opportunities found nowhere else on this planet. However, we have a disproportionate rate of gun violence compared to other countries. And none of those wonderful opportunities available in the United States will matter if an entire generation of our population is killed off by gun violence. The Road F. Shalom Task Force to Reduce Gun Violence began after the Sandy Hook tragedy in 2012. It was originally a forum for members to express their grief and various emotions they were having after that event. We then embarked upon a series of educational programs and engaged in advocacy on this topic. We have succeeded in adding Philadelphia to the Do Not Stand Idly By campaign, which is a group of municipalities that has requested information from gun manufacturers on their investment in safe gun technology and in their methods for ensuring responsible distribution of their products and avoiding straw purchasers of firearms. We have reached out to interfaith partners in our community and we have also recently worked, as you heard, to create a coalition of synagogues in this region to work together to reduce gun violence. I have found there to be a consensus that there is no single step or, and I do not mean to use a pun, but no silver bullet to cure this problem. The issue of gun violence must be addressed with a multifaceted approach. For example, we need to address who has access to firearms and who should not have access to them. We need to address conflict resolution in our society. We need to address why people decide to solve their problems by shooting one another. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, as suicide prevention, for example, is another very important topic. We have all come here as a community because we want to find the best and most impactful steps we can take to decrease gun violence and to eliminate the suffering it causes. It literally ends lives and for those who survive an act of gun violence, the trauma can last a lifetime. Earlier this week I was getting ready for work and I had the TV on in the background as many of us do and I caught a quote that drew my attention. 
There have been more mass shootings in 2023 in this country than there have been days on this calendar. So as we sit here on the 26th day of the year, there have been more than 26 events in the United States in which four or more people have been injured in a single act of gun violence. So tonight, we are fortunate to bring together a panel of experts on this issue. Some are experts because of their jobs, some are experts because of their life experience, but they are all dedicated to reducing gun violence and are here to help us understand the ramifications and how we can all help one another in addressing this issue. I hope I don't butcher the quote that Rabbi Friedman shares with me often and with our congregation. And it's from Pirkei Avot, which says, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. This is a difficult problem, but we can't throw up our hands in frustration. It's too important. So tonight you will hear some disturbing facts and some sad truths. And this is not meant to discourage you. Rather, we hope that it will serve as motivation. As I mentioned, we have a wonderful panel of experts that will hopefully spark you to action. And we're gonna call them up in a few minutes. But before we hear from our panelists, we're going to set the stage for the evening using an excerpt from an important and poignant documentary by one of our panelists, Mr. Arande McLean. Mr. McLean is a gun violence survivor, activist, and documentarian. He's a full-time father of five, a loving husband, a college graduate who works as a psychology tech at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. In April 2000, at the age of 10, Mr. McLean was shot in the head while walking in his Mount Airy neighborhood. He was in a coma for a month. He was unable to talk for 18 months and used a wheelchair for two years. Mr. McLean established the McLean Foundation, which advocates for gun violence prevention and for people with mental disabilities. This is an excerpt of They Don't Care About Us. I'm standing on the corner of Chew and Sharp Neck where 22 years ago I got shot in the head when I was 10. Standing here today, I feel like I'm blessed, but on the other side, I'm also angry because. I could have been some. I could have been another person. I could have been in the NBA. I could have been in the NFL. I could have ran for president. I don't know what I could have been because my life was altered with a bullet. All right, this is April 3rd, 2022. This is the first uh, shooting of oh, filming of my documentary titled "They Don't Care About Us." I did it because April 3rd, 2000. I lost my life for two minutes and 17 seconds, and I came back and I want to interview victims like myself that went what I went through. I felt like in my heart, the city didn't do nothing, the state didn't do nothing, nobody did anything for a victim or survivor like myself. And there's so many other survivors out here like myself, they don't get no help at all from nobody assistance, like even a phone call saying, hey, are you okay? I mean, I know family and friends does that, but we need our city officials to ask, to ask us, are, are we okay? We victims, we ain't die. I feel angry, I feel upset. I feel like nobody cares about victims all across the world. We continue to follow breaking news. A 10-year-old boy is in critical condition after he was shot in the back of the head in Frankfurt. Philadelphia police say the boy was caught in a crossfire of bullets as he walked home from school on the 2000 block of Margaret Street around 3.30. Investigators are searching for a Pontiac that had several people inside the vehicle. No one has been arrested as of yet. Doctors are treating the child at St. Christopher's Hospital. The Philadelphia
Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police is offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the person who shot Samajo Branty. The mother of a 10-year-old boy who was shot while walking home from school tells CBS3 that he is now fully awake and conscious. And then I just woke up in a hospital. How, how you feel when you was in the hospital? Did you know what's going on? I was sad a little bit, but and then that's when they helped me. And then that's when um, I was happy. Yeah. What, what did the doctors make you um, happy about? What did they do to you? They um, helped me to walk again. And talk, okay, and um, what else? And they helped me to um, um, me, 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 after he got shot, did anybody come to your rescue from the city? Did anybody come talk to you and say, hey, this is what we're going to do? Like the Well, District Attorney Lamar Stewart okay. came to me and put us in a hotel for four or five months. Okay. And anything we needed, they had us. Like I said, the organization for People's Army was there for with us too. So, you know, as far as the food and stuff like that, there's resources and yeah, they came and they helped us. I can say they helped us like that. So do you feel like the Philadelphia people the Philadelphia do you think Philadelphia cares about people getting shot? Like the survivors? I don't know if they don't care. Well my situation nobody never they never found nobody who shot Samaj. Okay. And nobody never came to me with well, Miss Williams. Um, this is what we got going on. This is all we know right here. Um, but we're gonna try to um, figure something out with you. Nobody never came and did none of that. So, so the first five months they helped they you out. Uh -huh. After that, first delivering and stuff like that, and you know, first delivering arrangements and stuff like that helped me out. But far as okay, well, Miss um, Williams, we're gonna try to get on top of something. You know, get on top of what happened with Samaj. Um, but we know this is such and such what went on, and we know this. I nobody never came to me said that to me. So I don't even know. Like I mean, like I said, I don't know what's happening. I don't even know what kind of car because I don't. I didn't even watch no stuff because I can't grab it in my mind and watch stuff like that. Nobody never came to me. And like I said, nobody never caught the person who shot him. We was working together um, in Frankie's world, and she used to always see me. Like struggle, I had a job, and she used to be like, "It's okay. Show you, show your scars." And she's a domestic violence victim, and I thought that all victims, I thought gunshot victims was just the only victims, domestic violence and rape survivors. They's not, they're not like us. But Free taught me that we all the same. Talking to her and her story is amazing. So what does it mean for you that you survived gun violence? I try to tell people it feels like for years it felt like you're like the loneliest person in the world because everybody's passing by say the same excuse my language bullshit and it's like you know if you would just deal with your trauma deal with your feelings it would be such a better world and then there was times where I felt I didn't even want to be in this world or I wanted to harm myself. I think that's the worst part of it. Um, but it's just like, you you have to figure out how you want to live this life and on your terms too. So it's scary too at the same time, but I'm not fearful. I think when I look back at it, it's like still overwhelming, you know? And you end up being a part of this very odd, strange, special connection with various people, like meeting Miss Rochelle, like Marcus Yates' mom, or meeting you, it's like, 
it's like almost surreal that you're in this world and you connect with these people. What would you say to the woman that's in, that was in your predicament back in 14 years ago? You don't have to be ashamed. I know your anger. I know the hurt. But you're still here. And nobody can take that away from you. No one can. Nobody. You have work to do, but know that the work is worth it. Ironically, I always felt like I don't know if I want to have a baby and things like that. And you know, and once I started looking and I think out of the fear in the back of my mind was always when I said, could I have children in that trauma room? So I had to do IVF. I actually went and found out that when I got shot, one of my fallopian tubes was, I call it wonky, but it's like, it's called a hydrospelling, so it's twisted. So any egg coming out of there may be prone to miscarry. So we started doing the journey and it was like, it's been three, it's been three years or almost three years that I was doing it really like, okay, I want to have a child. I want to create a legacy. I have somebody like the people that we are, why not have a baby? I, and I was like, you know, I think I could do this. So I had my second, it's called ICSI, so it's like an embryo transfer where you, it's like kind of like they put it in the Petri dish, it's all science, I love science. And they put it back in me, it's my own, it's my husband's firm, it's mine. And it's 12 weeks, and he is 12 weeks. How'd you meet me? Um, I met him, I, I looked him up on Instagram and said, I have to meet this guy. <laughs> I met him through Instagram and he got back to me and um, we had mutual friends and I, cause he wasn't returning my phone calls. So I got back to a mutual friend and he called me about a week or two ago. And I mean, he a victim. He was like, listen, nobody's going to exploit my story. I'm strong. Nobody helped me out anyway. Like he was frustrated. And I just told him, listen, I'm a Rhonda McClain, I got shot. I'm a victim too. And once you hear that victim and survivor move, we clicked ever since. Did you and your family ever ask for the city club? Yeah, yeah. I use um, Liberty Resources for a waiver program, which basically allowed me to have my own attendant. I could hire, you know, whoever I wanted to be my attendant to take care of me and make sure I get the help that I needed the right way. Um, where I lived at, I, we were fortunate enough to live in a condo when I came back to Philadelphia um, later on in life. So I didn't have to worry about getting a ramp. I didn't have to worry about getting a lift. Um, some of those things. I do know people who need those things, and I do know though that the waiver programs are beneficial. Um, but especially now in pandemic and crisis and all like that, I, I can't imagine wait times to get that service, to get those services needed. There is another resource that I have that I don't think a lot of victims in Pennsylvania realize. There's something called Pennsylvania Crime, um, Pennsylvania Crimes Victims Compensation, and basically they're a resource that will. <laughs> They're a resource that will compensate you for any funds that you have to pay due to your injury after you've been shot. Um, at the time I did it, when I got injured, uh, the, the, war, the amounts were um, six digits. So it's substantial and it really helps. Um, like if you like, I had to get controls put on my first car and they, they paid for it all. My first car. That was our first car together, but that was my first car. Like, that was the first car I learned how to get in and out of myself. I knew how to put my wheelchair in and out of that car. I had to learn how to, I had to learn. We went to Kelly Drive, and we spent like two hours learning how to put a wheelchair in and out of the car. Because I was going to learn how to drive. So basically, you kind of, you got to strap them on, you strap them underneath here, and then you just screw them down there to tighten them up and loosen them up. Push down the brake, pull the gas. One hand, and I use a spinner knob because my hand to turn the wheel, I don't have good dexterity with my hand to turn, so I use a spinner knob to help me turn. So that way I get to, I get to drive, I drive with one hand. And I have a shorter one, and I would use it for like transfers from like the bed to the couch, 
I mean, bed to the chair, chair to the couch. I have it in that car. That car is a lot lower to the ground. So that trailer is, that trailer is like a car. That's like a, I love that thing. I gotta sell it, but I love that thing. And unlock it. Now, this was the fun part I had to learn. I have to make sure when I park somewhere, I'm not on a hill. Because if I'm on a hill, the chair won't roll away. I'm not gonna be able to catch it. Mm -hmm. So when I come out, I have to like turn it into my turn it into the door, turn around, and be kind of like quick. I'm paralyzed, I'm always thinking five steps ahead. So in my mind, I'm all from day one, these suckers gonna fall off one day. I'm always ready. If I hear um oops, I slide over, I know where I'm good to go. But yeah, she's she's my helper, man. Everyone always told me, you know, girls, they're gonna protect you, they're gonna look out for you. And it took her a long time to get there. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, she just now getting into it a lot better, what are you but doing, Daddy? we're going for a ride. Well, one hand giving gas right now. And for me, my cheat code in life, cruise control. If you could change one thing about the city's response to gun violence, what would you do? One thing to response. <sighs> Can't say I want to say to my child here. Um, the, I, I, the police presence needs to actually care. I think they need to be more involved with the people, more involved with the communities. I think they could stop a lot of this. Not not by being harsh, not by actually policing, but just being a presence in the community, just being there. They could probably squash some of this stuff if they just handled it the right way. The documentary is called They Don't Care About Us. Who you think the they is? They don't know. The victims, the person that gets shot, the children that get shot, well as the parents. What do you think about that? What about you? What about you? Do you think they care about us? Um, yeah. You do? Why do you think they care about us? Huh? Why do you think they care about us? They do stuff for us sometimes. And then, uh, I think they care about us that way. And then, uh, no other people. Though. I think certain people care about us. Certain people, yes. Love us, care, love us. They is all like, and it sounds stupid and it sounds cliche. And I say, it's, we don't care about ourselves at times. We don't care about other what other people are. We don't. Nobody cares about each other. I think the frustration for me is when I hear people say, "Oh my God, it's five hundred, five hundred, it's five hundred, it's the DA's fault." So what? That doesn't matter who's in charge. When are we going to get in charge of ourselves? When are we going to get in charge and actually look at the trauma, the, the oppression, and look at our adverse childhood experiences and stop numbing as a coping mechanism for violence? When are we going to do that? And like I always keep telling people, the person you shoot is not the only person bo bothered by it. The effect of, it's, all, it's a whole ripple effect. So. I hurt for everybody because everybody feels it. And I think that's why it keeps getting, it's, it keeps becoming more and more because everyone is hurting and they don't know how to redirect that pain. I think I was put to this test and this process to get this change. Maybe I, I'll have been a lawyer fighting for the wrong justice. Maybe I'm supposed to be an advocate to teach these young people in these um, teens not to pull the trigger or these survivors how to help out with PTSD. Maybe that was my purpose in life. Victims and co-victims and normal human beings should live together at peace. So if you need help, ask anybody and everybody. And seek help. Don't hide and make it so, so you can get upset and blow up. Ask somebody for it.
think we can all agree that was a powerful way to, to set the stage. Uh, you've heard a little bit about Mr. McLean. I would like to introduce our other distinguished panelists here tonight. Uh, to my far right is Commissioner Danielle Outlaw. We're honored to have the Philadelphia Police Commissioner here. <laughs> Commissioner Outlaw leads Philadelphia's police department, which is the fourth largest in the country. The department employs more than 6,500 officers and 800 civilians. Commissioner Outlaw holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of San Francisco and a master's in business administration from Pepperdine University. Before joining the Philadelphia Police Department, Commissioner Outlaw served for more than 20 years as a police officer in Oakland, California. Commissioner Outlaw then became the chief of Portland, Oregon's Bureau of Police and Mayor Kenny announced Commissioner Outlaw's appointment as P Philadelphia's police commissioner on December 30th, 2019. And she began her tenure on February 19th, 2020, right before COVID hit. Uh, welcome, Commissioner, and thank you for participating tonight. Next, uh, I'm not gonna go in order exactly here at the table, but I have on my list next is Pennsylvania State Representative Jared Solomon. Representative Solomon was elected to serve, yes, Representative Solomon was elected to serve Pennsylvania's 202nd Legislative District in 2016. His district covers portions of Northeast Philadelphia. He is a graduate of Swarthmore College and my alma mater, Villanova Law School. In fact, I believe Representative Solomon, you started law school the fall after I graduated. Small world. Um, prior to his tenure in Harrisburg, Representative Solomon founded a local community organization and served as the association's president for nearly 10 years. Representative Solomon recently introduced legislation that will establish a gun violence task force in every county with a high rate of gun deaths. Thank you, Representative Solomon, for being here. And I'm a member of Rotary. I, that is one of the most important aspects that we should put a plug in, and Rabbi Friedman and our membership committee will be thanking us for that. Uh, to my immediate right is former Pennsylvania State Representative Todd Stevens. Mr. Stevens is a former member of the Pennsylvania State House of Representatives, representing residents of the 151st District. That district covers parts of Montgomery County in and around the Hatboro Horsham area. Mr. Stevens served in that capacity for 12 years, dating back to 2011. Mr. Stevens is a graduate of Shippensburg University and Widener Law School. And prior to joining the legislature, Mr. Stevens and I served together as prosecutors in both the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office and as Special Assistant United States Attorneys in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. I'll add, it's not on my page here, but he was also my courtroom captain for a period and I reported to Mr. Stevens. Um, we're here tonight to focus on an issue of great importance and not politics. But I would be remiss if I did not point out that Representative Solomon is a Democrat, former Representative Stevens is a Republican. And former Representative Stevens has taken positions on firearms legislation that at times has put him at odds with his Republican colleagues. I thank Mr. Stevens not only for joining us here tonight, for, but for his continued dedication to reducing gun violence even after concluding his tenure as an elected representative and for demonstrating how lawmakers can work across party lines to address truly important issues. Thank you, Todd. We are also joined by JFCS uh, Parent Education Supervisor, Lynette Ellis. <laughs> Ms. Ellis has been helping individuals and families for more than 20 years. Her experience ranges from direct service in social science and behavioral health to providing management, training, and facilitation for a variety of programs and modalities. Ms. Ellis has completed specialized training in trauma, and she uses that training to facilitate parenting classes, trainings and support groups. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. So tonight, I'm gonna to be asking some pointed questions of our panelists based on their roles and experiences. And our goal is for this audience to leave here tonight with specific and tangible action items that you can implement to reduce gun violence. It is great to discuss theories, but I know we all want to take action. Upon the conclusion of my questioning, 
I will open it up for questions from the audience. So as you hear the comments tonight, please make a mental note or jot down some questions, and I will um, call on the audience later this evening. So with that, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Alva. Um, Commissioner, perhaps you can begin by giving us a little bit of information about the current state of gun violence in Philadelphia, perhaps if you have some statistics to share with us, and whether we are trending in the right direction or the wrong direction. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. See, you put me on the spot first. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> first, I just want to thank, is it on? Can you guys hear me? I mean, everyone can hear awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Congregation Road F. Salome and JFCS for, for having us here. Uh, for bringing us together on such, I, I, I don't even know what to call this anymore because I live this all day, every day. Um, and I know there are some in the audience who do as well. Some, you know, you guys, you're up here with me, you do as well. So it's, it's beyond an important topic. I think we've reached the point of crisis a very long time ago. And Mr. McLean, I mean, if, if that movie didn't show the human side of what's experienced, I, I don't know what else does because I think it's really easy for those who don't touch this every day in some shape, size, or form to see it on the news, shake their head, and walk away. So I just want to thank you for really um, reminding us that there are human beings on the other side of this. Uh, with that said, uh, we, it's no secret that I, I got here, and the next thing you knew, a few days later, was something called the pandemic, in addition to a whole bunch of other things that happened, <clears throat> excuse me, once in a lifetime, whether personally or professionally, all these once in a lifetime events that would usually happen, maybe just once, they all came crashing down simultaneously, and we had to figure it out. We didn't have the luxury, we in law enforcement did not have the luxury of working from home. We were fighting for PPE with others around the world. Uh, other first responders were as well. And we had to create, I had to come up with policy on how to interact with individuals. We didn't, again, we didn't have masks, we didn't have sanitizers, all these things, but we're a very hands-on profession. And of course, as so human beings, we're social beings, right? So a lot of things shut down, but we still had to answer calls for service. We still had to go in people's homes. We saw that our officers were getting really sick. I lost a lot of officers. You name it, it happened, right? Uh, the murder of Corporal O'Connor right at the beginning. I'm sharing this because there was so much trauma packed and condensed into a short period of time. It makes you wonder not just how is law enforcement or first responders dealing with it, how is community dealing with this? And what resources are available for those who are working through this trauma? We saw the numbers shoot up almost instantly in 2020. Now, don't get me wrong, the numbers were steadily increasing going back to 2015 or so, but when you talk about gun violence, our non-fatal shootings and our homicides, the numbers shot up. And we know last year we saw a record year 2020, we lost a lot of our warm touch points, if not all, meaning that our schools were closed. So if little Johnny was out here acting a fool or out here, you know, potentially being a, a victim of some kind or maybe being a suspect or a perpetrator uh, in another way, we lost that warm touch point of going to the schools to find out where they lived, who their caregivers were, getting resources to them because they went online. They were virtual. And at that time, they weren't really, they didn't have a good way of tracking if the kids were even showing up to attend virtual school. All of the things that we would do to come back as human beings and reset just didn't, this didn't happen. This didn't happen. We didn't have that. We didn't get the chance to come and just vent and woosah and all the things, you know, uh, church wasn't in, in um, person either. And then there was an assumption that everyone in the city had the internet or had cameras or the ability to still connect in some form or fashion. The police department, we didn't have that. And, you know, again, I just got here. I'm an outsider. I don't have the, the advantage of people knowing who I was. So my onboarding was a lot different. I was meeting a lot of people for the first time virtually. And if that small group of people 
didn't have the opportunity to be in that circle to meet me, it was a long time before they got a chance to interact and engage. And for me to hear from them, to know how this was impacting them. So that was really, really a challenge. At the end of 2020, we saw that there were some very key things that was driving crime. A lot of what was happening, and, and, I, and I admit, I was one of the naive ones. I thought, well, there's a stay home order. That means people are gonna stay home, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not people that are already not intent on following the law. So a lot of people stayed inside, but those who had a beef or some kind of altercation or whatever it was, they were outside. And now they had an easier opportunity to assault or cause, cause harm to those individuals they were already looking for that might have been a little bit more difficult to find when everyone was out and about. So there was that. Then. You know, I like to tell a story about how I remember being in sixth grade, or a lot of us, you know, we were so excited about the first day of school and nervous at the same time, but I put my outfit out the night before because, you know, I wanted to get my best outfit and wear it to school, because when you got to school, that was who you were. You were building your persona, you were building your social capital. People saw you in person, and that was it. <clears throat> school wasn't in, everything went online. So now there's social media. Our young people are using technology more. So a lot of me who as, as I am, and we all know this, I'm not posting anything on social media that's not my best photo, right? <laughs> so we put our best foot forward on social media. Whomever I want the world to believe I am, I'm gonna put it on social media. This is now extended through music, uh, the type of music that our young people are listening to, the video games that they're playing, because there's more time socially being spent indoors and with technology. So this now turns into social media beefs. This now turns into confrontations. This now turns into you disrespected me on social media. Now I'm so angry, I'm also isolated. I don't have a lot of guidance at home. And I'm so angry when I come outside, I'm gonna shoot you. I'm not exaggerating. This is what we're seeing. Of course, some of our uh, shootings and homicides, or our non-fatal shootings and homicides, were also driven by narcotic sales. There's fights over corners that don't even belong to anyone. The supply chain is crazy. We don't have to talk about Kensington tonight, but we all know what's going on in Kensington. And as long as there's a supply, there's gonna be a demand, right? So narcotics and drug sales also drove a lot of the spike in crime that we saw in 2020 in addition to the social media beefs, in addition to the advent of technology, I can now be disrespectful in real time. And we're reactive. We don't have the ability to get ahead of something as easily as we might have been because it's all happening and unfolding in real time. So we recognize at the end of 2020, we had to do something to connect with our young people. But 2021, even things are slowly starting to open up again, things haven't settled. We haven't addressed what's going on up here. We still haven't addressed the lack of resources. We still haven't addressed the inequities sufficiently. I'm not saying we haven't at all, the city is trying, but it's still an issue. There's still a need for mentorship. There's still a need for accountability all across the board. And so we still continue to see record numbers in 2021. Now I am pleased to say that as of right now, the numbers are down. That tells us what we're doing is working as more services are being provided, as more opportunities like this, uh, where we have the opportunity to come together and, and share in collaboration, more services are being pushed out, more arrests are being made, the backlogs are being cleared in the courts. That's another thing that you know a lot of people don't realize. The courts weren't completely shut down, but there were a lot of backlogs of cases in the courts in 2020. So some of the frustration for us was, I arrest this young person today or whomever it is because they had open cases and they didn't get a chance to go in front of a judge. They're not a felon in possession of a, of a firearm right now because they, they don't have a, they don't have a, you know, a, a, a completed case for lack of a better term. I, I wanna speak in layperson's terms. So there was so much backlog that we found that there was a relationship between the victims and the shooters. A lot of the victims had uh, previous open gun cases or a lot of our shooters had been victims, and they also had open gun cases or previous gun cases. But because so much was backed up, they didn't get the consequences that they should have gotten early on. 
And so now we're seeing they're a victim of some kind or their families are victims because they're now suspects, right? So if there's this cycle that's finally starting to come to a head and people are realizing and seeing, oh wow, these things really happened in 2020. And you know, when I said it at the end of 2020, folks were kind of, stop blaming it on the pandemic. Folks, we have to open our eyes and realize what's going on here. This absolutely had something to do with what we're seeing now. There's so much trauma out there. There was lack of access out there. We're social creatures and beings. We're isolated and we're saying, well, where are the parents? Come on, we know where the parents are or where they're not. We have to teach conflict resolution. I heard it mentioned earlier. We have to teach our young people and even our adults ways to deescalate. I've gone out there and I've asked our folks out there, well, what, what will it take for you to get off the street? Well, I need more than just a job at McDonald's. I have to take care of my family. Oh, who's your family? Well, my younger siblings. You can deduce why they believe they have to take care of their younger siblings. So it's much bigger than just what we see on the surface. There's so many other things that have to be comprehensively addressed all at the same time. But again, I'm pleased to announce, and I'll give, oh my gosh, I didn't bring my test. But so far this year, our homicides are down 37%. And I'm also pleased to announce that our clearance rate is continuing to improve. Why is that important? When I first got here, um, you know, before the caseload jumped up, our clearance rates were in the high 60s, then it jumped to the 40s, then it jumped in the 30s, and then it got down to the 20s. We're close to 50 again. The national average is around 50. It's actually closer to 60 now. So we're doing better. We know we're using the right strategies. We know we're targeting the right people. We're making the right arrests, and we're ensuring that there's proper consequences for those people that are driving the largest percentage of crime. But there's still far more work to be done. So again, we're trending in the right direction, but I think it's important to pay attention to where we were historically all of the once in a lifetime things that happened over the last three years that got us here and finally recognizing that any solution that we come up with is gonna be long term. It has, we have to play the long game and we cannot continue to focus on just what's in front of us to try to get long term gains. Commissioner, um, so you, you addressed a, a lot of the questions that I was gonna ask you and I thank you for, uh, for doing that so we could go right to the point. Um, I do have a couple of follow-ups. So number one, you have a captive audience here. People who are here because they want to help and they don't know necessarily what to do. What is it, in your opinion, people can do, start tomorrow? What can they do to help the situation? So is it a matter of, and this is not an exhaustive list, but is it being more in touch with the police department and letting you know when there's a problem in their neighborhood so that the police can be in those neighborhoods and interact more with citizens? Is it volunteering at a community organization? What are the things that you see citizens can do to help you do your job? That, that's, thank you for that. Um, all of that, all of the above, D, all of the above. Um, <laughs> I say that because it's not any one particular thing. And you know, I'm guilty of it sometimes too. I pull up at home, I close, you know, I pull in the garage and I close the door and I'm like, please don't come ask me a question. Please don't come ask me a question. <laughs> right? But I know everyone on my block. We have to care enough to know who's next door. I remember again, I always tell stories about my grandmother when I was younger because I was so afraid of not just my grandmother, but everybody on my way home. <laughs> because I knew if I did something, they would go back and it would get back to my grandmother. I, I remember just very, somebody was trying to get me to say a curse word like two blocks up and I was like, no, my grandmother's gonna hear me, <laughs> right? But we've become, and for various reasons, we're afraid of our children. I say that in the collective we, right? We're afraid of our children. There are guns in our homes. We have to be nosy as parents. We have to be parents and not friends. Uh, or both, right? But then know who your neighbor is. And okay, every now and again, you're not going to be bothered. You're going to go in the house and say, please don't come ask me a question. But do you at least know your neighbor's names? Do you know their contact numbers if something happens? Do you know, you know the number to call them and say, something happened at your home, I just called the police, I'm concerned. Or I know they're not supposed to be there. Because you know one of the things that was mentioned in the video, and I, I, I believe I see it, we've become apathetic to to a certain extent, or that happens over there in that neighborhood. So why should I be concerned over here in 
this neighborhood. It impacts us all in one way or the other. So in addition to not just being nosy and, and you know, being compassionate and, and caring and empathetic, but also if you do have a talent, of course donate your time in the community. But when it's also time to support the police publicly, when we do something well, I would say please do it publicly. Hold us accountable as well. But I get a lot of, you're doing a good job. And I'll intentionally go, I'm sorry, can't you say that louder? I can't hear you. <laughs> because 2020, quite frankly, kind of turned into a time where it wasn't cool to uh, support policing publicly. And a lot of us in the uniform will tell you we've lost a lot of friends. Or we don't talk about certain things at the dinner table just because of the narrative changing. But at the same time, if you call 911 and we don't get there fast enough, it's a problem. So, you know, it's like, which is it? So again, it's not just supporting us publicly, it's holding us accountable when we do mess up. And it's also being the best recruiters for young people or whomever in your neighborhoods. If they wanna be police officers, say, you know what, I support you, go ahead and do that. Not just because we get this a lot. Oh, why would you wanna go do that? Why would you wanna go be a part of them? but at the same time demanding some form of transformation within the police department. So I think it's all of that, but there's so many other internal variables that we have to address to ensure that those of us here doing the work feel supported when we do go out important. and do our job. Thank you, and I could ask you a million more questions, but I, I gotta- I feel I like wanna, I'm hogging, I, so let's I pass wanna, it No, I wanna way. make sure we, uh, we, I get to ask some pointed questions of others on the panel. I'm gonna go to um, Representative Solomon. Um, could you, tell us what legislation is currently pending in Harrisburg that affects or addresses gun violence. And I'm also interested to hear um, what the task, force, task forces would do in those counties that is in that legislation that you proposed. Thank you so much, and thank you to the RS community for having me. Um, I, I did want to start with something that Rodney had said because I thought it was really important. In the video at the beginning, um, you said Sometimes you think it would just be nice for a public official to say, hey, how you doing? The idea of presence and just common humanity and empathy is sometimes in the political class something that we lose sight of and we need to kind of regain um, because so something important's going on. <laughs> something important's going on. Because every life that is lost uh, is an individual that has a family, a future cut short, a lost love, and that person is not just the number on a data sheet. So we, as leaders, and I try to do, the, do this in my community, reach out on every time there is an instance of gun violence and have a meeting with uh, faith-based leaders, mental health leaders, the second police district in my neighborhood to just show love and show common humanity. So I think that first is really important. Second, before we get to the legislation, and I will, um, we need to not just do what the commissioner said in terms of saying thank you for your service, because that is a good start, but we also need to um, be advocates for more investment in the police, right? So we say all the, everyone in Northeast Philadelphia, whenever they mention a problem, I said, well, what, I asked, what did you do about it? Oh, I dialed 911. Well, but that was a dispute between you and your neighbor about high weeds. Well, yeah, but we thought we would get some resolution and they didn't show up. Okay, what people want, and this was also mentioned in the video, someone said that what people are looking for is the police not to be heavy handed, but to be sort of invested in communities. In order for people to know the people's places and things in neighborhoods, to have sort of sexual, sec, sectional integrity, so that police squad cars are moving in common areas, getting to know uh, students in areas, schools, faith leaders, and our friends and neighbors and communities, you need more police officers. No one in my community, 
and I represent the most diverse community in the city of Philadelphia, and by extension, the diverse in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, has ever asked for less police. They might have asked for a different approach and a different type of policing, but not less. So it's not just saying thank you for your service, it's asking for investment in our police. Uh, in terms of legislation, well, we don't have a functioning House of Representatives right now. So that, I'll say it again. We don't have a functioning House of Representatives right now. So I don't know how many of you actually know this. If I want to introduce a bill and pass a bill today, I am actually not able to do that. We don't have committees, we don't have chairs, we don't have rules, nothing. The Senate does, it is sad. Uh, so I can tell you what we want to pass when we get in the legislature. We'll and start I think, there. <laughs> I think that the, we will have, uh, the Democrats uh, for the first time in, in over a decade should have the majority uh, in, in mid-February. My, oh yeah, you can clap on that one. <laughs> Not that I didn't love working with you, Todd. I did, and I still will work with my Republican friends. But a bill that would take me two and a half years to pass, now will take me two to three weeks. So it is, it, I think it's, it's going to be a, a different approach. So gun violence task force, I think it's important to get that into statute. This isn't rocket science, this is a proven model that works. If you have high levels of gun violence in a community, you need to add more line DAs who are efficiently and effectively prosecuting gun-related uh, crimes, and you need to have um, more officers in the AG's office that are investigating those crimes. And the beauty is that this pushes, pe pushes government together. So government typically does not, re government loves a silo. You show us a silo, we'll embrace the silo. The beauty of the gun violence task force is says, you can't be in a silo anymore. Law enforcement, we actually, in, our, in the bill that I crafted, have a bit of prevention, so it brings some community members to the table in the gun violence task force, all working together, all rowing in the same direction. Uh, Todd's bill, the a red flag bill, that he has been a tireless advocate for in the legislature and has done a remarkable job. We couldn't. We couldn't even get Could that you out of committee. Just give a quick summary of that for people who are not familiar with what a red flag law is. So, so, um, and I don't want to conflate mental health and someone who uh, who who presents an extreme uh, risk to the community. But basically, there would be an adjudication in court that an individual presents an extreme risk to themselves or someone else, and then you could get a extreme risk protection order that would temporarily take that firearm away from the individual. I mean, the Senate did a piece of this. I mean, they, I don't think they went far enough, but they at least opened the door to this by encouraging the states to embrace this model. This is, is something that works. So we talked about policing and, and advocating for more re resources, but I would also ask all of you to advocate for this legislation and specifically focus on the chairs of the committees. The chair, once we have committees in the State House, the chair, Democrat and Republican, of the Judiciary Committee control the world. They decide to kill a bill, it won't move. They decide to embrace a, me a measure, it can move very quickly. So focus on the chairs, uh, House uh, DNR and the Judiciary, and the Senate DNR. That's, I think, what we all can do. Oh, and one other thing. This is to your point, Commissioner, too. Uh, not only get to know your neighbors, which is important, but please clean and maintain your block. Please. So the Penn study that came out locally told us that if we invest in our blocks through home repairs, cleaning up, greening up, and lighting, do you all see this, as much as a what? 20% drop in gun-related crime. It's our study. 
we can be a part of effectuating that study on our own blocks by showing some love in our community. So fantastic points, and I think it's, again, a note that people can do starting tomorrow or whenever the committees are in place, find out who those chair people are, send a postcard, send a letter, look up extreme risk protection orders. These are things that we can all do to help the cause. I'd like to love to pass the mic to Todd, if I can. Um, so, Todd, I'd, I'd like you to talk to what can be done to find common ground across party lines, especially in a state like Pennsylvania. And I think it's, you know, it's obvious, but I think it's something we need to talk about. You know, we have a gun violence crisis here in Philadelphia. There are other communities around the state that do as well. And this is an urban community. You have a lot of Pennsylvania that is not urban like Philadelphia. You have rural counties. You have people who have Second Amendment that is um, in their DNA and their family fabric, and they love hunting, and they love being outdoorsy, and they love that part of their heritage. And they see it sort of as, well, that's a Philadelphia problem. That's not our problem. So how do you work across those aisles and have everyone come to an understanding that, you know, are we giving up some of our Second Amendment for the sake of saving lives in an urban area? Is that, is that the question we have to address, or is there another way to approach that issue? So um, it's, a, it's going to be tough to condense that answer into the time we have here because Sorry. it's a, a very complicated issue. Um, you know, First, Doug, your leadership in bringing us all together is, is really remarkable. And I just appreciate the fact that you've assembled this group and, and took the lead on this. Thank um, you. That was no question. very much a team effort. <laughs> For sure. Um, you know, it's interesting because we talk a, a lot about how uh, gun violence is a multifaceted issue. And that, that's the, the phrase that uh, Doug used earlier. It's a phrase that I would use all the time. What's interesting is I've been led by the data. I mean, I'm you know, I'm an evidence-based guy. I like data. I like to look at numbers. Um, I, you know, um, Adam Garber from Ceasefire is here in the back. I, I, he was my go-to for data when I was in the House. I, I mean, he would he would suggest we need to move a piece of legislation. I'd say, do you have some data to back that up? And um, he, he, and he, 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 no problem. He always had it. Always had it. Um, but I think that's really important because you know numbers don't lie. I mean, you can look at data, and you know, it's not it's not just anecdotes. So. You know, become informed about the data. And I, I'll tell you, what was eye-opening for me, and you know, you heard about my background as a prosecutor uh, working with Doug, um, and so I was shocked. When I went to the House in, in 2010, you know, I was focused on reducing gun violence. And when I said gun violence then, I really meant homicides, um, because that's what I had become familiar with, sadly, through my work um, as a prosecutor. What was astounding to me, and it wasn't until after Parkland, Florida, that I learned that the majority of gun deaths are actually suicides. And that, again, not trying to use a pun, but that blew me away. I mean, I was shocked that the majority of gun deaths, both in Pennsylvania and nationally, were suicides. What's interesting is there, there are two very different issues um, homicides and suicides, and when you look at, you know, who the victims are, they're very different groups. Homicides, sadly enough, it's young male people of color. Suicides, it's old white males. So males were done um, <laughs> across the board. But, you know, it's just two totally different demographics. And so when you look at a map of where uh, the suicide rate is highest. It's in many of the counties that have the highest per capita gun ownership rates, which is not a surprise. There is a correlation between gun ownership and suicide rates. And it really comes down to a very simple and basic, easily understandable fact that, you know, if, if you try suicide with a firearm, you know, you're probably going to be successful. Um, sadly enough, firearms are a really good way to kill. And so if that's your goal, um, you know that you'll you'll probably succeed um, and not get a second chance. And so, I think what's really important is to try to have a, a data-driven conversation with people in the parts of the state that 
that really do embrace firearms as a part of their culture. I mean, it is as much a part of their culture as you know the Philadelphia Eagles might be for us, or, or cheesesteaks, or soft pretzels. Uh, you know, it's and I'm not trying to to trivialize the the impact that firearms can have it by any stretch, but it is a rite of passage for you know children to go hunting with their fathers and their mothers. I mean, I can tell you. My assistant in Harrisburg, she grew up in South Central Pennsylvania. I mean, she's been hunting and killed a deer, you know, which, you know, when you think of a, a young woman, you know, when I, when I met her, she was not too far out of college at, you know, Millersville. And I was like, really? Like, you've been hunting? And you know, she's like, yeah, everyone in my family has. That's what you did when you were growing up. Um, and so I think, you know, if you, if you peel back the onion a little bit with folks and you then start asking questions like, well, do you know anyone who's died by suicide? Most folks will tell you they do. Um, that doesn't get front page news, right? You know, the homicide rate is a daily occurrence. I'm sure the commissioner hears about it more often than she wishes she, she had to. Um, you know, it's all over social media. It's the lead story every night on every news station. Um, there's always an article in, in every paper about the homicides that are occurring. But you don't have that same attention given to suicide. That's something that's much more personal. It's not something that's put, you know, put in the newspaper. So the fact that the majority of gun deaths are suicides is not something that the average individual across Pennsylvania knows. Heck, I, I mean, I was a firearms prosecutor and, and in the House of Representatives for many, many years before I even knew it. So I think that if we can raise awareness about that, and, and use the data to help inform the conversations that we're having, I think you know, we can move the needle. But you know, we do have to, you know, it's interesting, I, I would tell folks all the time that folks in rural Pennsylvania only want to talk about the homicide problem going on in Philly, and folks in Philly only want to talk about the suicide problem going on in rural Pennsylvania. And you know, I think that um, to the extent that we can recognize that there are issues in both areas that we need to work together to solve, um, I think we'll be that much better for it. But I, you know, I just think it's important that we have a dialogue, a conversation, you know, evidence-based approaches, data-driven approaches, and you know, try to try to look at. We don't have to reinvent the wheel on some of this stuff. Other states are doing things that are working, and we can point to that data. Um, that's what persuaded me. It's what persuaded the members of the Judiciary Committee back in 2018 to move the, the red flags bill out of committee. Um, and I'm hopeful that it will, you know, still inform and, and help move that bill again uh, whenever you guys get up and running. I joked as you were talking, you know, look, I, I leave and the place, you yeah. know, just falls apart. We I need, don't know. We need time. Uh, <laughs> um, if you could um, hand the mic to Aronde. I, I, I was so impressed with, with your documentary and I, I would love to speak for hours. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time, but I really would love to know, when you speak to people, what is the message that you think has the most impact? What part of your story gets people's attention most that they want to change their behavior? Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I want, I want to say thank you <coughs> for the cuts. Every, every, every time I'm in a forum like this, I always remind myself and everybody that's in the forum that I always I love police officers and I, I thank them every time I speak before I go to bed before I wake up because it was two officers two weeks out two weeks out of the um the uh, what you call it the um, the two two weeks out of their uh, I think academy and they saved my life. It, used, it usually take 13 minutes to get to the hospital where I got shot at. They drove in 90 seconds. So I, every time I'm, I speak, I always say thank you to the police officers. Um, so I wanted to say it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when, when, I, when I talk to people, uh, the message I tell everybody is, listen, um, I was a 10-year-old boy. I, w I wanted to run. I wanted to be played a hero and everything. And my life was altered. You could be 10, you could be 99. A bullet could change anybody's lives. And when I talk to young people, anybody, anybody, that's the message I'm trying to tell them. You, you can do anything. You don't have to pick up a gun. You don't. When I, when I was little, 
they used to make us fight. And then we used to hug. And they because my best friends, we fought to death. And they, they still my best friends to, to this end. And I just tell everybody, let's be friends again. Like, we don't have to shoot each other. It's like they don't understand. Once you shoot somebody and they dead, they dead. They're, they're not coming back. I don't think people realize that. Like, I always tell, I have I have five children, and I tell them all the time, like, once you shoot somebody, and they, they be like, Dad, why are you telling me this? It's just like, I want to say it out loud all the time. Once you shoot somebody, it's over. Your life is over, and their life is over. Because I say the other person's life is over, because even if you don't, if, even if you don't get caught, you still have to run for the rest of your life. Nobody want to be like that. Um, so when I speak, I tell them that message. And to my uh, survivors, I tell them that we still got to go strong because you turned over a new leaf. Now, I mean, you gotta, you're not 100%, but you 80 90%, you alive, though. You can wake up and smile. So that's what that's I That's a great them. message. And, I, and it goes right into my next question for Ms. Ellis, if you can hand the microphone down. Um, I'd love to hear about the programs that you offer. And one question that I, I referenced and, and mentioned to you early this evening when you arrived, how young is too young? When can you start to talk to children about these topics? And you know, you might have to use different language, but when can you start addressing gun violence issues with children? Thank you, great question. Greetings, everyone. Apologies for my phone. It's Hype is super, super hype to be here. Anyway, um, I am glad we have this forum because this hits home for me um, because unfortunately my cousin Anton Ellis was a part of that number 500 May of 2022. We lost him to gun violence. Um, so I can relate to the parents that we serve because this is something unfortunately that they go through. So some of the programs that we offer our parent education and what we do with that is we I like to say we are beacons of hope because we talk about the hope that is still there the healing process not just the fundamentals on parenting education and skills and strategies on how to develop your relationship with your children but there is hope and that they can be a part of that process we also talk extensively about connections we need to connect with our children and not just you and your child, but I like to say our babies, because it's all of us. So as um, the commissioner said, you might be tempted to hurry up, please don't ask me any questions, mm -hmm. but you would be surprised at your ability to connect, to just ask a child, how was your day? How are you doing in school? Or better yet, like they did old school, what you doing? What you up to? <laughs> it's all a part of connections. The second question that you had was, how young should we talk to our children? As soon as they understand, as soon as they comprehend, the language that we can use is what they are able to understand at the age appropriate time. Because it's not a set number to start talking to your children about trauma related to gun violence. They see it, they hear it, they experience it. But when we connect with our children and we get to know them, we get to know their language. We get to know how to explain to them what may be going on without overwhelming them. And finally, offering them a safe place and space to heal. A lot of times if we can let them know that we're scared, that goes a long way. But it really comes down because I, I take away from this, what can we do today? What I will say as a professional in this business for years, connect. Connect with something that you're passionate about. Everybody is not going to be on a soup line doing volunteer. It's nice, that's fine. Give up some money. That helps. <laughs> it helps a lot, right, Paula? That helps. <laughs> All right? With preventive programs. Give of your gifts and talents. Our babies, our babies, to the opera, to different various cultures and environment, it goes a long way. They may be tempted to come to you when they have a problem if they can't go to their parents and say, I don't know what to do because you've connected. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am committed to getting, yes, thank you. I am committed to getting everyone out of here at a 90 minute program, so by 8.30. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna take two questions. I know it's hard. Um, the first hand I saw was the gentleman in the back. Um, and if you could um, say your question loudly, I'll try to repeat it for everyone to hear. Thank you for your service. Is that, is that your question, is why they're not being used? Is there anyone who can address that? Um, are you clap? Yeah, you can clap for the question. We, um, sir, uh, we actually just did sort of what you're doing, so what you're saying. So we took a vacant lot, uh, short dumping site, that had been littered with trash for over a decade. We partner with a nonprofit. It's now a beautiful park called the We Love You Park. And you'll like this, Commissioner. Five months after the park was put in place, we looked at the, your website, the crime stat, and if you did a, drew a perimeter 3,000 feet around the park, crimes down 40%. And it is a little small triangular park. So imagine if, you, to your point, if we took all of those vacant parcels in the city and, sh and, and, and really worked in a collaborative way, friends, neighbors, nonprofits, government officials, imagine the work we could do. Can the, can the funds that are going to different community groups in Philadelphia related to gun violence, can they be used for those kinds of projects? I, I don't know. Are you talking about the nonprofit money that's been yeah, pushed so out? Yeah, so there's on the website, uh, on the city's website, there's a list of a bunch of organizations, community organizations, who are receiving funding to decrease gun violence. And, and I'm just wondering if money can be used for that kind of purpose, like to rehabilitate an area for that purpose. We did at the state level. There you go, okay. So we, and all this cost, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's not a lot of money, but uh, it was a $25,000 grant. We paid for the equipment, and the nonprofit did all of the work. Okay. And we're going to another parcel uh, in this upcoming year. I got one last question, and the woman in the mask right there was the next hand that I saw, so you'll be our last question for the evening. So that's just in Philadelphia or uh, nation across nationwide? nationwide. Okay. Bottom line, Scattergood is really um, doing a lot of work with it and rolling it out. 988, so okay. Okay. This is important to kind of get
Thank you. So um, I want to conclude with this, and thank you. Um, a great resource that is not partisan but does a lot of work to, to go to the heart of this gun violence issue is Ceasefire PA. And we are lucky enough to have Adam Garber, who's the executive director, is right here. Um, so if you go to ceasefirepa.org, there are a lot of resources. There are events. There are statistics. Um, that are very helpful to, um, to fight this, this important issue. So I want to get everyone out of here and back home to their families or other things that they want to do this evening, but I want to give you all my heartfelt thanks for showing up tonight, because showing up, I think, is the first part in all of this. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank JFCS and Road of Shalom. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.